Good morning, church. I'm so excited to be worshiping with you this day that the Lord has made. Will you grab your Bibles, a cup of coffee, and get ready to worship God today? We have an important message for the church this day. For God has called us to follow his example, and that is to suffer well here on earth and know that we are entrusted with heaven in our future. So as we live life for God here on earth, we have an opportunity to suffer in a similar manner that Christ suffered here on earth, but also we get to give God glory through it. So let us seek to entrust our lives to God. Let us seek to be his ambassadors to a lost and dying world, and let us seek to make God's name known. Let us live for him. Let us seek him. Let us find him today. Will you seek to tune out any distractions this morning and let us worship God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for this day that you have made. We thank you, God, for the opportunity to worship you. I pray, Lord, for every person who is at home right now. Lord, I pray that you would speak to them this morning as we lift praises to your name and as we sit under the preaching of your word. God, would you empower us to be your followers, your ambassadors, who seek to do your will and your good here on earth. Oh God, we thank you for all that you have done and all that you are doing in the midst of our church. Continue to lead us and guide us. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. worship our King and come let us bow at His feet He has done great things and see what our Savior has done and see how His love overcomes He has done great things oh He has done great things Conquer the grave, you free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great. been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. Oh God, you do great chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, I say your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Sing hallelujah. And hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. Conquered the grave, you freed every 
every captain and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, oh, where can I lie? Oh, Jesus, I say your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. You have done great things, oh God, you do great
worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. And so there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. You are holy. And only there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me in you alone and I will not be shaken as I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and I will put my trust in you time singing this morning. We, uh, we're going to sing a song called Death Was Arrested, and this one just reminds us where our hope is, and our hope is in Christ Jesus alone. And I pray that as you uh, sing along with us today, that you would find that hope, that you would find that peace that we have in him. Death was arrested, and that's when our lives began. Lord, 
alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to be Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was a rest and my life be Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained my orphan heart was given and my morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance when death was a rest in my life began. Do your grace so free washes over me. You have made us new, now life begins with you. It's your endless love. And it's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new, now life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom, he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested, my life began. And so your grace so free washes over me you have made me new now life begins with you it's your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new with you. And our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus rose with our freedom in hell. When death was resting, my life began. Do your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. So it's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made new now life begins with you and we're free and so we're free free forever we're free come join the song of all the redeemed yes we're free free forever and then when death was arrested my life began we're free Forever we're free, we come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free, forever and then. When death was resting, my life began. When death was resting, my life began. When death was resting, my life began. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of worship that we've had today. Lord, we ask that, this, that these songs would be an offering of praise to you, an offering of true and genuine praise this morning. We ask that your name be glorified above all things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Let us continue with the mindset of worship and praise as we give back to our God. 
today with our tithes and offerings. I just want to give you an update on the Great Exchange Initiative. God is providing for our church in just tremendous ways. And so I want to thank everyone who has given to the church to the Great Exchange Initiative. We are going to continue to be raising funds for the initiative, which is set at $35,000, and we are going to be raising funds through the end of January. Today, we have $22,500 given in pledges and donations. Will you prayerfully consider how you can help us advance the gospel here locally, nationally, and around the world by giving to the Great Exchange Initiative? And of course, we are still needing to, to provide for the ministry that is done here at Exchange Avenue. So let us continue to give to all that we are doing here at the church and all that God is doing in and through our midst. Let us be faithful. I just want to thank all of you as your pastor for everyone who's been so gracious and faithful to give the way that God has called them to give. Let us continue to follow him in and through this and let us reach our goal of $35,000. Let us pray. God, we thank you so much for how you are moving in and through your church. And we ask, oh God, that you would bless the gift and the giver as we give back to you today. For you gave your son for us. Let us, oh God, give back a little to you that shows, oh God, that we trust you, that we are leaning upon you, and that, God, we are willing to follow you. God, we thank you for how you are moving in and through our church, and we ask that you will continue to have your way, that you will lead and guide. And God, we ask that you will continue to provide for us as we seek to love you and love our neighbor for the glory of God, the good of the city, and the salvation of souls. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Church, let us continue with the mindset of worship and praise as we examine God's word today. We'll be in 1 Peter chapter 4. Examining verses 12 through 19. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. We know that in this book of 1 Peter, suffering has been brought up much. And we are going to be talking about suffering today from a Christian worldview. And as we have all seen in the past few months, that our culture does not like when people suffer unjustly. So if there is any injustice in our society, in our culture, it seems as though we as humanity are trying to eradicate it, get rid of it, and that is a good thing. We don't want people to suffer for suffering's sake. We don't want there to be injustice just for the sake of injustice. So we need to try as best as we can to get rid of that at all costs. What Christ says to us through Peter is this, Christians will suffer. So we will suffer injustice, we will suffer unjustly. And I want to remind you of this from 1 Peter chapter 3. We'll begin in verse 20. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For this is... You have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example so that you might follow in his steps. So what was Christ's example? It was this. He committed no sin, neither was there deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body, on a tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. When we think about a Christian worldview of suffering, and when we even think about being a Christian, the reality is we must examine our Savior, our Messiah. For Christ is the one in whom we are to embody, we are to look at as our example. And if Jesus was perfect as he was, if he lived on this earth, what yet the earth rejected him, we should not be surprised if and when the world rejects us. I think there is a misunderstanding in many people's eyes today. And that misunderstanding is this. If Jesus had come for the first time today, 
in 2020, I believe there is a group of people who believe that Jesus would love all people, that he would accept all types of lifestyles, all types of communities, all types of living because they see him not as one who taught a moral or religious or even civil standard, but they just see him as someone who is all about love. And we know that when Jesus came, he taught and spoke the very words of God, and the religious people hated him for it. And those who did not believe in God did not know what to do with him. So ultimately, those there in Jerusalem They wanted him to die, and the Romans saw him as a good civilian, but they also did not want an uprising there in Jerusalem, so they sentenced him to death. The heathen sentenced him to death, the unbeliever sentenced him to death, and even the religious sentenced him to death. For Jesus was rejected by all. If Jesus came back today, the same fate would happen to him. The world would despise him. The world would reject him because of his message. So today, as Christians, we must not grow weary. We must not expect that everyone is going to like us, that everyone is going to accept our message, that even because we even call ourselves Christians, there might be animosity against us just because we have that name. We should not be surprised in it, but rather we should see it as an honor to face the same kind of suffering that Christ took for you and for me. This morning, we will find out that our living hope in Christ provides a Christian worldview of suffering. To an unbelieving world, suffering has negative connotations, especially when it appears unjust. But for Christians, suffering for the sake of Christ is a blessing, revealing God's glory and an opportunity to worship him by rejoicing and praising him in the midst of suffering. The purpose of this sermon is to examine three responses to help you face suffering with a Christian worldview. To help you face suffering with a Christian worldview. And the first response is this, expect to face suffering. We will find this in verse 12. Will you look there with me? It says, Beloved, do not be surprised at a fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. So we see already in verse 12, in this section, 12 through 19, that we are called as Christians to expect suffering. We are not to be surprised by it. And we have already laid the foundation that our Christ, our Messiah, our Savior suffered. And so if we are his followers, we should expect the same response by a sinful world that is unbelieving the message that he came and proclaimed But we as believers know that it is true and we follow him. So no matter what comes our way, blessing or cursing, we continue to keep our eyes on God. And so my my friend today, do not be surprised. And notice what this says, a fiery trial. And I just want to remind you that 1 Peter was written roughly in 64 AD. In that same year, 64 AD, Rome the capital city of the Roman Empire, burned. And Nero was the one who was at the head of that burning. He was the emperor at that time. And many who lived in Rome blamed Nero for it. For when they tried to put it out, his army came in their way. Many people lost everything they had. But Nero, knowing that he needed a scapegoat, knowing that he needed to blame someone, blame the Christians. And so the Christians now came under great persecution in Rome. For everybody, blamed them not only for the burning of their city, the loss of life, a complete disruption to the norm, 
but it became a curse word to be a Christian. Nero, it is told, would take Christians and wrap them in pitch and then dip them in oil and set them on fire to light his dinner parties. I couldn't imagine what it would look like to see a, 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 at one time at a live person lit on fire to be a torch. But know that what was taking place in Rome didn't just stay there. The animosity and also the report of the persecution that was taking place in Rome went throughout the world. So now Peter is writing to a group of people there scattered throughout the Roman Empire. And he's writing to them not to be weary about what could happen. But he's actually pointing to them to this reality that a fiery trial might come their way. And it shouldn't surprise them if it did. And also, it not only shouldn't surprise them, but if you look again in verse 12, you'll see that it's as though Peter is saying, expect suffering and also don't feel like it's strange if you are being persecuted, if you are going through suffering. So expect it. Don't be surprised by it. And then this is not like there's something wrong with you if you're facing persecution or suffering. But rather, this is the norm for the Christian life. And that is a completely different understanding of suffering than what our culture and society has in it today. We are called to flee anything that would be painful or harmful or hurt that would hurt. And we are called to seek to live as comfortably as we can here on earth, not ruffling many feathers. That's what our society tells us to do. But what Jesus is saying in and through Peter is he's saying, expect this, and when you face it, don't be surprised and know that you're in the midst of my will. So this is not something that is strange, but rather this is something that we should rejoice in. <clears throat> which is the second aspect of the sermon. Rejoice when you suffer. Will you look at verse 13 and following? But rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's suffering, that you may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because of the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Wow. So notice we are called to rejoice in suffering. And, and I just want to, to share with you that this is the hardest part of the message for me. I can expect suffering to happen. I can expect persecution to take place. But as that is going on, I don't know about you, but for me, when hardship and strife and persecution is taking place in my life, that my natural reaction isn't to say, I'm going to rejoice God in, because of my suffering. I'm going to rejoice God and in God as the suffering is taking place and thank Him for it. That's just not my natural tendency, so this is an area in which God is really working upon my heart. We know that in James it says that we are to count all trials as joy. And so in the same way, we are to see suffering and we are to see persecution not only with joy, but we're to worship God and rejoice through it and in the midst of it. But notice what Peter is saying. But as you rejoice... Know that you share in Christ's suffering. Now, this is very interesting because Christ suffered, the spotless, perfect, sinless Lamb of God suffered once and for all, for all the sins of the entire world. And I just want you to notice what happened in Christ's suffering. For he suffered, paying, paying the penalty for all sinners. And what he was doing on the cross is he's actually bringing a remnant, bringing those who will believe in God to God. So anybody who places their faith and trust in Christ, they can have their sins forgiven. They can have their sins washed. What does that mean? Because Christ suffered, 
those individuals who place their faith and trust in him no longer are going to be punished in, in eternal hell. So suffer for all eternity. But because they placed their faith in Christ and Christ was willing to suffer, now they're going to enter into eternal glory, into eternal heaven, and they'll be with God. So notice, as Christians, we have given God our lives, we have believed in Him, that we have forgiveness of our sins, and we've actually exchanged eternal suffering for momentary suffering. We traded eternal punishment for heavenly joy for all eternity. But notice, we are here in the already but not yet. And the already but not yet is you are saved, you've been redeemed, you've been justified, but you haven't been glorified yet. That, that will happen when you go to heaven. So now as you walk through life on this earth, you know that if you suffer for the sake of Christ, you suffer not by yourself, but you suffer with Christ. You're not alone. So now you, empowered by the Holy Spirit, can walk in and through whatever God is bringing your way. And how does Peter say it? But you can rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's suffering. So as you are sharing in Christ's suffering here on earth with your momentary affliction, as Christ suffered for a momentary suffering when he was on the cross, it wasn't for all eternity. He was on the cross for a day. He was dead for three days, but he rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven and he is alive forevermore and he'll be returning. He'll be returning. He's going to call the church to himself and we will have a new body when the new heavens and the new earth come and we'll have an eternal body just like we have an eternal soul. But note this, we will have that gift of eternal life because we believed in Jesus. Because we believed in him. Because we asked for our sins to be washed white as snow. So you have the opportunity right now to share in Christ's suffering, which is amazing. Christ suffered on earth for a season. You will suffer on earth for a season. But note this, it won't just be a suffering for a season. But notice what else it says in verse 13. That you may also rejoice. So we have rejoicing in momentary suffering, and we have rejoicing and be glad when his glory is revealed. And when will his glory be revealed? At his second coming. So church, my friend, let us not be surprised when suffering comes our way. Let us not think there's something wrong with us because we're suffering. But rather, the Christian worldview is this, that we are going to suffer here for a moment, for a period. But we are taking part in what God has called us to do. We're actually joining Christ in his suffering when he was on earth. That we may be found faithful, that we may be found to rejoice and have joy, when Christ comes back. It's an amazing reality. Verse 14. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him Glorify God in that name. Now, in, in the first century, when Peter was writing this, the word, the term Christian was actually not really used by the church. The term that was used more commonly by the church was followers of the way. Because Jesus said he is the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by him. And so we are followers of the way because we have the one way to heaven. And if you want to go to heaven and you don't want to have an eternal punishment for your sins, you follow the way maker. You follow Jesus. But the, the people who actually were using the term Christian were actually the Gentiles, the, the non-believers, and they were using it in a derogatory fashion. So the church actually redeemed a term that was actually meant 
to cause pain and suffering to Christians, to those who are followers of the way. But Peter now uses this term, Christian, and I believe that he's using it because it carries those meanings. But as a Christ follower, we know that we carry the name of Christ. That's what Christian is. We carry that name of Jesus Christ. That we believe in the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And so as we carry this name of Christ, it actually, it actually brings with it the power that our God has. And so if we are to suffer, which is what Peter is talking about in this section, if we are to suffer, the reason we are to suffer here, in, here on the earth as a Christian, as a follower of God Almighty, is because of that name, the name of Christ. No other name should we be lifting up or elevating to the point of Christ. So we should not, as Christians, suffer because of a, of a political party. We should not suffer because of an evil thing that we do. Notice this, what it says in verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. So in our culture today, we believe that people should suffer if they are murderers. If people do great and grievous evil, they're evildoers. We all, as a society, believe that they should suffer and there should be punishments consequences for their actions. If you steal something, there should be a consequence. There should be a punishment. That's what a thief is. Or a meddler. Someone who just sticks your head somewhere where it's not supposed to be. You put yourself into other people's business. We know that that's not right. So what Peter is saying is, Christian, you should be civil. Christian, you should love your neighbor as yourself. Christian, you should be a great employee. You should be an upstanding citizen. A model for what it looks like to obey the law and order here on earth, but also to entrust your heart to God. For you shouldn't suffer for any of your actions here on earth just because you are doing evil or you're doing something wrong or because your conduct is out of line. But rather, Christian, you should suffer for the name of Christ. So the, as Christians, we actually carry this name. That's what it's called, we call ourselves Christians. But also, the name of Christ is, is what we proclaim. So when we go and share our faith and our hope with those around us, we carry the name of Christ and we proclaim that name. So if we receive persecution, if we receive suffering, if we receive hardship, when we share the name of Christ with those around us, we should A, expect it, we should B, know that that's the norm, and C, we should just continue in the midst of it. For we've been called to obey, we've been called to abide, we've been called to follow God. And notice what it says in verse 16, that we are not to be ashamed of our suffering, but rather praise God through it. So as we are taking God's name to a lost and dying world that is dark and evil and does not believe in Him, we should expect that some will reject and we should pray and expect that God will bring salvation to others. Because our God wants all to be saved. And so he is working in and through us to advance his gospel. And when hardship comes our way, can I tell you this is a test of our faith. It is our test of our faith to persevere, to endure. And when we persevere, when we endure, our faith and our strength and our endurance in God is only solidified. For as we suffer, our dependence in God grows. And what does God want for us? To depend on him completely. God wants us to obey him fully. God wants your heart. He wants your soul. He wants your mind. He wants to be your strength. We know that in our weakness, he is stronger. But if you never actually allow your weaknesses to be used for God and his glory, those weaknesses will never be strengthened. When we're put to the test, we now have an opportunity to allow God to move in a miraculous way in and through our lives. Christian, will you today seize an opportunity to allow your faith and trust in God to deepen, to further? Notice what it says in verse 16. 
If any of you suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. You know, there's a name that every knee will bow, and that is the name of Jesus, the Christ. We should not be ashamed that we are Christ followers. That we believe in him, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Christian, we must glorify and praise and worship God, even in the midst of suffering. As I said, this is the hard part for me, because I can expect it, and I can process and rationalize my way through people rejecting the gospel and then in turn persecuting me. But I have a hard time in the midst of suffering to have the mental space to say, you know what? This is actually an opportunity for me to glorify God. This is an opportunity for me to honor Him. This is an opportunity for me to praise Him in the midst of this hardship, in the midst of this suffering. Because I'm actually taking part in the sufferings of Christ. I'm actually doing the will of God. And in my weakness, he will be stronger. God, I trust in you. And now my dependence upon him, it's now strengthened. I'm now pushed into him. We've seen expect to face suffering. We've seen rejoice when you suffer. And lastly, let's see, entrust yourself to God through suffering. Did you notice this in, verse, in chapter 2 of 1 Peter when I was reading during our introduction? It says this, in, ch in verse 22 of chapter 2. He committed no sin, neither was there deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued, notice this, continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. So our Christ, in the midst of his suffering on earth, entrusted himself to the Father. And so as our example, what are we to do as Christians? We're to, we're to live as Christ lived. So as he entrusted himself to God, we must entrust ourselves as Jesus entrusted himself to God. We must do the same. So Christian, as we are now walking here on earth, what are we to do? We are to entrust ourselves to God. Let's look at verse 17. It says this, For it is time... For judgment to begin in the household of God. And if, it, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Verse 19, the climax. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to the faithful creator while doing so. So Peter says that the time of judgment has come and it's going to begin not only here for the world, but it's going to begin, the time of judgment has come for the world, but it begins in the house of God. So what does Peter mean by that? We know that the, the last times, the end times are now marked in biblical terms, because Jesus has come and he has lived the perfect sinless life and now he's risen and gone to heaven, so we are waiting for his second coming. We're in now the time period known as the last times in biblical terms. So Jesus could come back at any time and in any place, but what is, what is happening to the household of God? The household of God is being refined. So how is the household of God being refined? We're being refined through trials and hardships. And so what this means is we're being sifted through. God is allowing hardships and trials to come our way so that the true believer will be seen. And those who are just imposters, those who haven't given their heart and, and life and soul to God will be revealed so that either they can give their heart to God or they'll fall away. And so as this, this sifting is now beginning, notice what is going to happen. And it's a question that Peter asks if this judgment is hard and the suffering is difficult for the household of God, for the Christian, how much more difficult, how much harder will it be for those who are the sinners, those 
who are the unbelievers. And we know that the reality is, and we've already talked about this, is that for Christians, we are facing just a momentary affliction, a momentary suffering. But for those who don't believe in Jesus Christ, there will be an eternity of suffering. And the Christian, and the Christian worldview is this. We want everyone on earth to hear the gospel and have an opportunity to believe it, an opportunity to repent it from their sin. We don't want a highway to hell. But we want all to be saved. So Christian, are you willing to go, even bearing the scars of Christ, even facing persecution? Are you willing to take the good news of Jesus Christ to those who may reject it? And may, they may hurt you. I just want you to know that the momentary suffering you may face is but a twinkling of an eye compared to the eternal glory you already have in God. Peter quotes from Proverbs and he says that if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? But we know that the ungodly and the sinner will be condemned and punished for all eternity. So Peter concludes by saying, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will, what should they do? They should entrust their souls to the faithful Creator while doing good. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, the conclusion comes to this. For those who suffer according to God's will. So you suffer because you carry the name of Christ. You suffer as a Christian. You suffer because you are sharing the good news of Jesus to a lost and dying world. You are facing persecution, not because of your evil deeds, but rather you're seeking to faithfully follow Christ and do good. If you are in the midst of God's will, suffering as what has been outlined here in the text, According to God's will, know that your faith is being strengthened and you are in the midst of God's will. This is not an anomaly, but rather this is where God has you. So you're not outside of God's will. You're in the midst of it. Be faithful. And do exactly what Jesus did in the midst of his suffering. What did Jesus do? He entrusted himself to God the Father. And we are to entrust our souls to the faithful Creator. For God created the heavens and the earth. God created you. God created me. And we can entrust ourselves. We can entrust our lives. We can entrust our souls to the One who created us. For He has a plan and a perfect purpose for us. Will you be faithful to follow Him today? Will you be faithful to entrust your heart, your soul, to him today. Will you? And notice, in the face of suffering, according to God's will, so not according to yours, but according to God's, you're to entrust yourself to the Creator. And what are you also to do here on earth? You're to continue doing good. Loving those around you. Praying for those who are persecuting you. And seeking to be a light to your enemy. My brothers and sisters, my friends, we have an opportunity as Christians to love the world the way that Christ loved the world. And the way that he showed himself, the way that he showed love to the world is he laid his life down for her. For God so loved the world that he gave. Do you love the world enough to give. To give of your comfort. To give of your time. To give of your energy. That you may follow the will of God, even in the face of suffering. Entrusting your heart to God. Entrusting your soul to God. Knowing that this momentary affliction, yes, painful, but no, this momentary affliction is but a brief moment and you have eternity 
in front of you? Will you live with a living hope? Will you live as one who sees eternity at all times? Christian, let us seek to make God known here in our city and around the world. Let us be faithful to him, to follow him. And if you're here today and you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus, know this, just like myself, I was born into this world and I was born into this world a sinner. And you, you've sinned. You've broken God's commandments. He is a holy God. And the way that He has provided for your sins to be covered is by the giving of His Son. The giving of Jesus Christ. Who lived perfectly, meaning He never sinned. But He died a sinner's death for you and for me. For He took your place on the cross. He took my place on the cross and, and he died on that cross and he took upon himself the very wrath of God. But because he had never sinned, death could not hold him. But he paid the price for your sin and mine. So today, if you place your faith and trust in Jesus, if you turn to him and ask forgiveness, oh God, forgive me of my sin. Oh God, I know I have I've gone away from you. I, I, I haven't believed in you and I've done wrong. Will you wash me? Will you cleanse me? Will you make me new? God will hear that prayer and he will do that. He'll save you. He'll wash you. He'll make you new. You have an opportunity in a moment to be saved. And you might say, well, I don't even know what it means to be saved. And I can tell you what it means here. You live here on earth bound by time and bound by sin. Death is coming for all of us. But if you place your faith and hope and trust in Jesus, you now have the hope and have the guarantee of an eternal life with God. Not by your works, so not by your goodness, but by the goodness of God, the goodness of Jesus. For he did it all for you. If you, today, place your faith and trust in Christ for the first time, would you text me? Would you email me? John at exchangeokc.org. And I'd love to help you on this faith journey. For you can walk with God here on earth. For God loves you, and he wants you to know him. For he knows you. He created you. He knows the trials and the hardships that are in your way, but he wants to give you eternal life. You have eternal punishment coming your way, but you can receive the greatest gift you could ever have in Christ. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you so much for this time that you've given us. God, I pray that you would have your way in and through the preaching of your word. God, may we examine and see suffering from a Christian worldview. For our Savior suffered, and we know that suffering is a part of life here on earth as Christians. And so, Lord, I pray over Exchange Avenue Baptist Church. I pray for all who are at home right now listening to these words. I pray, God, that you would provide. I ask, God, that you would give endurance and strength for each to follow you. That, God, each will entrust their heart to you. And, God, whatever come their way, that they would be strengthened to endure and to continue to abide in you. May we follow you. May we trust you. May we know you. Help us, O oh God, to be your, your worksmen, your ambassadors. Help us to do the work you've called us to do. Help us to share your good news. And, God, I pray that at this church, we would see a revival. We would see an awakening. And so, God, we ask that we'd have your favor upon us as we go. And, God, we would see your, your Holy Spirit unleashed upon our community. God, that it would push back darkness and souls would be saved. God, we thank you for all that you have done and all that you are going to do. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.